Hello and welcome to today's Peter Town Hall meeting with Peter President Ingrid Newkirk, Peter Senior Vice President Kathy Guillermo, and Associate Director of Evidence Analysis Dan Payden. My name is Ben Williamson and I'm Peter's Senior International Media Director and I'll be co-hosting our discussion. Today's meeting focuses on the success of Peter's vital work to save animals from cruel experiments and training exercises. Ingrid, Kathy and Dan will be joining us shortly on the line and together they'll give you an inside look at how Peter's scientists, investigators and researchers with the help of our generous supporters are stopping deadly and painful experiments on animals promoting the development of innovative non-animal testing methods and getting animals out of laboratory cages. All three will be answering your questions live after our presentation, so I hope you'll stay on the line throughout today's call. If you have access to a computer, you can stream this meeting uh, directly on your browser uh, at peter.org forward slash October Town Hall. Once you're logged in, you can watch images of the work we're discussing today and listen in without using your phone. For those of you on the phone, at any time during today's town hall, you can, press, you can ask a question simply by pressing zero. From there, you'll be transferred to a Peter staffer who will record your question and put you back into the call until it's time to ask it live. Our town hall meetings always generate a tremendous number of questions, so please get yours in early for your best chance to speak with Ingrid, Kathy, or Dan later in the meeting. This town hall is being held during the final hours of Peter's Animals Out of the Labs Challenge, and every donation we receive today will be matched dollar for dollar, meaning it will have twice the impact of the work that we'll be discussing. Having your gift matched today couldn't be easier. Just press seven at any time during the meeting. You can also take advantage of this matching gift challenge online by going to peter.org slash match and giving before midnight tomorrow. For those of you just joining, welcome. My name is Ben Williamson. I'm Peter's Senior International Media Director, and I'll be helping to host this event live with Ingrid Newkirk, Cathy Guillermo, and Dan Payden. Please don't forget, throughout the call, press seven to ask a question, or press, sorry, press zero to ask a question, or press seven to make a gift that we matched today. And now I'll turn it over to Ingrid with news on a significant victory that I know many of our supporters have been cheering since Friday. Ingrid. Thank you, Ben, and I always like to start off with a victory, so I'm so glad to be able to do that. Hello, everyone. I'm so glad you could join us today for this special town hall where we'll be, as Ben said, working um, to tell you all about our um, efforts to stop cruel and deadly experiments on animals. I'm in Peter's Sam Simon building in Norfolk, Virginia, where we, you are all very welcome to come and visit us. If this is your first time participating in a Peter Town Hall, hello. And if you are um, one of our regulars, welcome back. Um, I do believe that whatever it is, your first or your or seventh, you'll emerge from today's meeting very excited about the many ways that you're helping Peter keep dogs and all the other animals safe from vivisectors. But as Ben said, before we begin, a victory. Many of you have probably already heard about this tremendous victory that everybody on this call, I am sure, helped make possible. You know about our case with the 150 or more greyhounds that we found on a blood farm in Texas. That's where they're used as blood donors. Well, we won. They are finally leaving their filthy kennels, and they're now being transferred to adoption programs. The blood farm is shutting down, and the dogs who were the victims of a lifetime of abuse on dog tracks before they got there are coming out. So our work to win the release of these greyhounds began because of a caring person who recognized their suffering and they asked us for help. That whistleblower, to whom we will always be indebted, as will the dogs, told us of um, the dog's condition, severe dental issues, ghastly infections, and horrific neglect uh, everywhere he turned. Immediately after we were contacted, Dan Payden, who is going to join us in a bit, and his whole team began gathering evidence. 
and investigating what turns out to be a quite lucrative business of blood being sold to veterinary clinics. And it was Dan and his team who devised the plan to get these dogs out of that hellhole as quickly as possible. From the moment that the Washington Post revealed our expose, uh, cries to, to free these dogs grew into a roar. We had 200,000 people demanding the dog's release through our action alert in less than a month. And with your help, we aggressively targeted the farm's owner and this multi-billion dollar veterinary supply company that was buying much of the blood that was collected on that farm. And today we're seeing the happy result, 150 or more greyhounds finally able to get out and of that place, escape their misery, have a chance of a peaceful retirement, which they obviously so richly deserve. Before this case became public, I will bet that many of you didn't know that there was such an industry built on the suffering of dogs. This expose was the first ever to blow the lid off the trade in the blood of abused greyhounds. But you know us, Peter has always been about firsts. And that will lead me to where I was going to start and will now start about vivisection. Um, it was back in 1980, uh, when most of our staff probably weren't even born, that Peter lit the fuse that ignited the global movement against animal testing, animal experiments. That was when we went inside a federally funded laboratory in Silver Spring, Maryland, and as some of you will remember, we revealed to the world the absolutely horrifying condition that um, monkeys lived in there. That case was also all over the Washington Post, and it was on 60 Minutes. It was everywhere because that was the first time, a very, very exciting moment, when people were able to see inside a laboratory. The lab doors were swung open to the public. That case, the Silver Spring Monkeys case, was Peter's first eyewitness investigation. And as many of you know, it led to many other firsts, including the first ever cutoff of an NIH grant to experimenters, the first criminal conviction of an animal experimenter for cruelty, the first confiscation of abused animals from a laboratory, and the first United States Supreme Court victory for animals used in experiments. So Peter's work on vivisection began with that Maryland laboratory in 1980. And today, we have prevented millions, millions of animals from ever going through that kind of pain and fear that the monkeys endured in Silver Spring. So to give you some idea of how far we've come, that took a long, long time. But it took us just days to convince a company called House Foods House Foods is one of Japan's largest food companies. And we found out they were experimenting on animals. And they had been for years and years. It took us days to end those experiments. And we had already persuaded Coca-Cola, Barilla, the pasta company, Kikoman, the soy sauce company, and many other food companies to stop experimenting on animals as well. And these are really hideous experiments. They don't just give the food to the animals. They're force-fed, and, and horrible things happen to them before they're killed. It was a Peter eyewitness expose that prompted the US Coast Guard, as you may remember, this year to become the very first branch of the armed services to stop shooting and stabbing and killing animals in those trauma training drills. So we're making lots of progress. You're going to hear about a lot more and some things we're working on that are quite secret. But if you will be so kind, please let me ask you, um, just give this vital work for animals an immediate boost. Press 7 on your phone and be part of the solution here. Every gift made during today's meeting, whether it's $5 or it's $5,000, it's going to be doubled through this PETA's Animals Out of the Labs Matching Gift Challenge. If we raise 500000 before midnight tomorrow, we'll be able to secure 
$1 million in funds to support all of the work that Dan and Kathy and I are discussing today and much, much more. A million dollars that will go towards all our work to get the animals out. So if you want to support that, please just press 7 on your phone. A PETA team member will just walk you through how easy and wonderful it is to give. And if you're joining us online, you can just open this new browser tab. Visit PETA.org slash match, PETA.org slash match, and have your gift match dollar for dollar while you're still listening in to the town hall. Over to you, Ben, please. Thank you, Ingrid. Um, and just before we talk more about this latest PETA victory and other fascinating new cases, I'd like to remind all of our listeners that we'll be answering your questions live later in the meeting. So to ask your question about any part of our work for animals, just press zero on your phone and you'll be transferred to a PETA representative who will take your information and return you to the town hall. And again, if you're listening with us online, you can ask your question directly through the question button at the bottom of your screen. Thank you, Ben. I'm about to introduce some, someone special, but first, uh, people are already calling, and I just want to thank you for being among the first to give on tonight's calls. That is just fantastic, and I'll be announcing um, some names later on, but thank you. Every year, Peter spends millions of dollars investigating and exposing these um, cruel experiments on animals and providing um, concrete information and lots of pressure to get the animals out of labs. So your support of this work is deeply appreciated and it's vital. I'm already hearing, here comes a list. Uh, Patricia of Westmont, thank you so much. Chelsea Garden Grove, thank you. Jamie San Francisco, $100. David of Brampton, Ontario, $500. Susan Norwalk, California, $5. Thank you so, so much. Everything absolutely helps, it's tremendous. Now, let me bring in Peter Associate Director of Evidence Analysis, Dan Payton. Very special person. Dan is joining us for his fourth town hall meeting. So in addition, and I don't mind singing his praises because I'm so glad he's with us, he's a brilliant advocate for animals, and he's behind many of Peter's precedent-setting cases. It was Dan's work that led to the first ever conviction of sheep shearers in Australia for hideous cruelty and to dozens of charges against a pet trade dealer in Colorado that helped thousands of animals. Dan helped expose an infamous laboratory in North Carolina, and he was responsible not only for uh, closing it down, but for bringing the first felony cruelty charges for the mistreatment of animals in the laboratory in U.S. history. There were um, misdemeanor cruelty in the Silver Spring, felony in the North Carolina lab. Dan is going to discuss that nightmarish farm in Texas, the blood bank, and how we got the greyhounds out, um, and many other things. So over to you, Dan, please. Thank you so much, Ingrid. That was a very honorable and honoring uh, introduction, and, and thank you. And, and thank you to all who are on the line. It's a pleasure to join you tonight. None of what we do is, is possible without you, so thank you so much for your support and, and everything you do for animals. It, it took a tremendous amount of work to get those dogs out of that hellhole, and, and so I'd like to give you some background on what was found there and how you helped make this victory possible. If you or a loved one has, has ever received a blood transfusion, obviously that blood was donated by a volunteer. But for dogs undergoing urgent veterinary procedures, the blood they need may come from greyhounds, who, as Ingrid was speaking of earlier, were first exploited in the cruel racing industry and then ended up condemned to a life of misery on a so-called blood farm. It's hard for me to imagine, and I'm sure it's hard for you to imagine, purposely breeding dogs in a way that increases their instinct to run, <clears throat> then prohibiting them from running at all by keeping them in small pens for years until they're of no use to your business. But that's exactly what happened to dogs confined to a kennel, really just an abandoned turkey shed, that was doing business as the pet blood bank. At this place, that whistleblower Ingrid spoke of earlier documented the suffering of scores of greyhounds. Most of them had been dumped there by racetracks. 
kept solely for blood collection, these dogs were denied veterinary care for severe health problems like open wounds and even a broken leg. Greyhounds, as you probably know, have very thin coats and very little body fat, and so they're very sensitive to extreme temperatures. And yet, in the scorching summer heat of Texas, those dogs lay listlessly on the dirt. And in the frigid winter cold that got below freezing there, they shivered and they shook. And their only protection against those elements was a simple old plastic chemical tank, a pesticide tank, with one side just cut out. Photos show many of the dogs had nails so overgrown that they painfully curled up into their paw pads and caused those dogs to limp. And in a crude attempt to treat ticks and other parasites afflicting the dogs, the workers doused those animals with a pesticide that was designed to be sprayed not on animals, but on trees and on concrete buildings. And as you can imagine, that pesticide blistered the dog's skin. It even got in their eyes and irritated their eyes. Rotting teeth, dental infections, and painful gum disease were common, making it so difficult for some of the dogs to eat that they seemed to be quite literally starving to death. One such dog was named Milo, and many of you are seeing Milo on your screen right now. He was rail thin when our whistleblower found him, and here's why. His mouth was ravaged by dental problems so severe that they had left him with so few teeth he could barely chew the small amount of kibble he was given each day. And one day the whistleblower showed up to work and he found Milo dead. And Milo was trapped under the wire side of one of those dirt floored kennels at this old turkey shed. And it was soon after finding Milo that that brave soul picked up the phone and alerted PETA to the dire situation he was seeing there. Dan, that's that's so sad. Um, I just want to jump in here a second to, to just to say to everybody pressing seven right now, thank you so much. We're getting such a heavy call volume and we are going to get to everyone. So please keep pressing seven and keep listening into the call and we will get to everyone very, very shortly. Now, Dan, I, just, I know that when this case first broke, many of us were surprised to learn that such blood farms even existed, let alone that so-called retired greyhounds were the ones being abused on them. So can you tell us just a little more about how and why the greyhounds were being used and, and how we got the dogs out of that Texas blood farm? Absolutely, Ben, I'd be happy to. Um, much like humans with what we know as type O blood, uh, many greyhounds are considered universal donors in the canine world. And so for the pet blood bank, the blood drained every three to four weeks from those abused animals was worth huge amounts of money. And so it didn't seem, uh, the operation didn't seem to care one whit about the misery that it inflicted on them. For instance, workers at that Texas farm snared those frightened dogs. They were called, quote unquote, cringe hounds. They snared those animals with a homemade catch pole and dragged them uh, about 75 feet across the dirt to a trailer on the pro property to be bled. And for as long as three hours, both before and after they were bled, those dogs were kept in crates. And oftentimes they were muzzled and they were kept in the full sun without any access to water. And that's for a total of six hours a day. Some of those dogs were so weak after workers took as much as 20% of their blood volume that they had to be carried back to the same lonely, filthy kennels. Soon after the Washington Pro Post broke our expose, the multi-billion dollar distributor of much of that blood from that farm, which was an outfit called Patterson Veterinary Supply, announced that it was terminating business with the farm and vowed to facilitate getting appropriate care for those greyhounds. And initially, we were very thrilled. But six days later, Patterson did an about face and they released a pitiful statement saying that the company wouldn't be taking any action at all to actually help those dogs. So to help give these long neglected greyhounds a chance at the peaceful retirement they always deserved, uh, we ran provocative mobile billboards 
near both the Blood Farm and Patterson's headquarters in Minnesota, demanding the dog's release. PETA supporters like you, almost 200,000 of them, like Ingrid said, began holding protests, flooding uh, the, the, the owner, flooding the company with calls and emails, protests near the company's headquarters and at the home of Patterson's president in St. Paul, and even PETA friend Sir Paul McCartney, who so cherishes the memory of his dog that he wrote that beautiful song, Martha, My Dear, about one of them. He interrupted his concert tour to add his voice to this campaign, writing a powerful letter to Patterson's president, urging him to immediately end these dogs' suffering by buying them and sending them to the reputable greyhound rescues that were lined up. Just last week, we started ramping up the pressure even further with the announcement that we'd purchased a share of Patterson stock so that we could push company officials from inside their own boardroom to both help retire the dogs in Texas and end the despicable practice of using captive dogs as blood bags. Now, while today about 150 long-neglected greyhounds have their freedom, we are still on the case. In fact, we had a meeting about it today. We are expanding this until we reached every licensed veterinarian in this country about where they source their emergency blood supply. So please, next time you go to your vet, ask your vet where they source their blood from and tell them about this case if you would. Yeah, please do, please do. And uh, just before we continue, I must say I'm just deeply grateful um, to the lifesavers who are pressing seven and coming through for us and helping us with this match. We really want to make this match so much. Sarah of Great Falls, Montana, $35, thank you. Ainsley, Charlottesville, Virginia, 25 Bob. Lawrenceburg, Indianapolis, Iowa, Indiana, $35. Chris of Los Angeles, $100. And it goes on, and I will uh, read some more. Actually, Laura, I think I know you, Laura of Encinitas, $1,000, family member of the Peter family. Tammy from Florida, $10, thank you. Karen in Connecticut, 25 Deborah Montana, $50, thank you, thank you. Mice and monkeys and greyhounds, thank you. Joe of St. Louis, 25 Geraldine of New Jersey, $5. This all helps tremendously. Lisa of New Haven, $25. Thank you all so, so much. Um, I think everybody knows greyhounds. If you've ever known a greyhound, they are just the dearest, sweetest dogs. They crave attention. They crave affection. They're just so harmless. Um, we've had reg rescued greyhounds in our office, actually, and I can attest that they are dear. Um, obviously, it's not just greyhounds. It's no dogs uh, should ever be enforced to endure the misery we exposed on the blood farm. But that is over, and now we're expanding. Um, for those of you who haven't watched the video, please go to peter.org slash blood bank right after this town hall. That's peter.org slash blood bank. And then you can use that video on your social media, please, to show people how important it is to find the source of um, your veterinarian's blood for dogs who need transfusions. Because while the dogs in Texas are leaving that awful facility, blood dogs still need every friend that we can muster. Ben? That's right, Ingrid. Um, and if you have any questions about this victory for Dan or for Ingrid, or indeed anything that we're discussing today, do remember you can press zero on your phone for a chance to ask it live on the air a bit later in the call. And as you heard earlier, right now we're a little more than 24 hours from the end of Peter's Animals Out of the Labs Matching Gift Challenge, which means every single gift made during today's town hall up to our $500,000 goal will be doubled. So please, please help us reach our goal before tomorrow's deadline by pressing seven on your phone right now and making a generous gift. If you prefer to give online, simply visit peter.org slash match and your donation will be matched there as well. Thank you, Ben. We have Joan from Arizona giving us $100. That will become $200 that goes to save animals. Maria of Sanford, Florida, another $100 becomes $200 to save animals. Linda of Lynchburg, Virginia, thank you very much, $100 to save animals. Stephanie in California, 25, it's wonderful. Britta in Florida, 30. 
Lily in Virginia, 50. Lorraine in Melville, 30. Melinda in Florida, $250. This is really, really absolutely tremendous. We are striving to meet that match, and it means so much to uh, our work and the animals who will benefit from it. Um, let me introduce now my longtime colleague, Peter's Senior Vice President, Kathy Guilherme. Some of you may remember her as the author of Monkey Business. That was the book that revealed just how important the Silver Spring investigation was to the whole global movement to stop animal experiments. Um, I could give her a longer introduction, but time is of the essence here. So Kathy, uh, she's going to discuss a couple of important recent cases that her team has been working on and the steps forward that we've made already, thanks to your help. Kathy. Thank you, Ingrid. Right now, in a small town in central New York, dogs and cats are secretly suffering and dying in experiments paid for by some of the largest drug companies in the world. A PETA eyewitness investigation of Liberty Research, which is a contract laboratory and a breeding facility that sells thousands of dogs and cats used in experiments by U.S. government agencies, by pharmaceutical companies, and many large universities. This eyewitness investigation gives us a glimpse at the pain and the fear of animals who are treated really like they're nothing more than living test tubes. If you look behind the windowless walls of this building at Liberty, you would almost think that they were a hoarding facility rather than a well-funded laboratory. Mother cats are forced to give birth over and over again. Their kittens are quickly whisked away soon after being born and they're tattooed with a number and that's the closest thing they'll ever get to a name in this place. Our eyewitness found dozens of cats packed into a cramped pen that's a little bigger than a garden shed. And being forced together into such a tiny space made fighting and competition for food inevitable. Some cats appeared to be desperately thin because they didn't get enough to eat. Two workers mentioned finding cats suffocated, dead, under flipped over litter boxes, which is a, simil a situation that's similar to the one the USDA cited at Liberty for just last year. To give you some idea of how disposable animals are to Liberty, one cat named Jade, by our eyewitness, just J-A-D-4, to Liberty's experimenters, suffered from severe seizures for nearly a month after management was told of his condition. And when the decision was finally made to euthanize him, a veterinarian advised a worker to check to see if there was a need for dead cat's body parts. Kathy, if I may uh, interject, I worked on this case as well, <clears throat> and I know that it's it's not just the cats who are suffering at this facility at Liberty Research. In one hideous procedure I remember watching video of, workers drilled holes directly through beagles' skulls and injected the December virus into their brains. Some of those dogs blinked and even whimpered during the painful procedure, and they woke up moaning. A senior worker the next day, reported seeing one of those dogs walking in circles while another repeatedly banged her head on the cage floor after that procedure. Several dogs became lethargic and stopped eating. Some foamed at the mouth and others had seizures. And each of these dogs was left for days, for weeks, to suffer from their symptoms without any treatment whatsoever. And each was killed at the end of the so-called study. You know, these experiments are sickening enough on their own. But when you learn that there has been a distemper vaccine in use for decades and that dogs are infected with that virus through inhalation and not through the brain, those beagles suffering become even more unconscionable. And when Liberty needed to make room for more experiments like this one, workers sometimes got rid of their unwanted laboratory equipment, meaning in this case, the dogs. And when that happened, one poor dog in particular endured more than seven minutes of agony as they tried to end her life. She was fully conscious and she was gasping before she was finally killed on the fourth try. Uh, I think Kathy, what the really... Before you, yeah. before you go back, let me just pop in here because... Um, as you know, this means this match means everything for our work. So I just want to say some thank yous, if I may. 
Um, and I, I just really want to thank everybody. Uh, Valerie Eaton Rapids gave us $15. That becomes $30. Connie from Florida, $25. Emily from Brooklyn. Hi, Emily. $20. Thank you. Dr. Kaplan from Pennsylvania, $500. That becomes $1,000 that goes directly to stop vivisection. Joelle from New York, $25. Love you. Thank you. Megan from Washington, $45. Carol from New Hampshire, 5 makes it 10 Thank you all. And back to you, Kathy. Thanks, Ingrid. I think the really awful thing is that what our eyewitness saw at the facility in New York at Liberty, it's not all that different from the kind of misery that we discover in many laboratories that conduct experiments on animals. Liberty cut corners at almost every turn, including tattooing rather than simply microchipping the animals held there and using the same animals in test after test, apparently without even understanding the long-term effects of the experimental compounds and the possible interactions with other medications. And worst of all, even when non-animal test methods were available, Liberty still used animals. In an experiment that Liberty carried out for a pharmaceutical company, they used young dogs who were injected with megadoses of an opioid and then subjected to multiple blood draws. They became, as you could imagine, lethargic and depressed and refused to eat. And that suffering happened even though microdosing, computational methods, and cell-based me methods could have easily been used instead. And in experiments funded by another company, workers injected an insecticide into dogs to evaluate their tolerance to it, although a synthetic skin could have been used instead. Most of the companies who hire Liberty to carry out tests on dogs and cats send their representatives to tour the facility before they do. These representatives have a chance then to see the substandard housing, the animal suffering, and the carelessness of the employees who work there, and yet they still sign the contracts keeping Liberty and companies like them in what we know is the lucrative business of breeding and torturing animals for the sake of these crude tests. We've alerted local, state, and federal officials to these horrors that our eyewitness uncovered there, and thousands of PETA supporters have written to Merck, to Bayer, and to these other large pharmaceutical companies to urge them to immediately reassess their relationships with Liberty. Animals are still being tormented behind those windowless walls. And your support today will do twice as much to power this work to stop the misery that we routinely find at facilities like Liberty. So if I could just remind you, you can press 7 now to make a difference during this special matching gift campaign. Yeah, there is just, well, a little more than 24 hours left in this challenge, this double it challenge. So please help uh, if you can. We're very anxious to reach that. $500,000 goal. Francis from New York, $100. Bless your heart. Um, Pamela, Washington State, $100. Thank you, thank you. And Lafayette, $100. You know, that's between the three of you, that's $300, make $600. That's pretty wonderful for what we're doing. I'm very appreciative of you all for stepping up um, today. So please, anyone else, come on, join it. Uh, press 7. And you'll be with others who just like you care about this vital issue. The dogs and all the other animals will love you for this. So thank you. Back to you, Ben. Thank you, Ingrid. And before we bring back Kathy to talk about a wonderful recent victory, remember that Ingrid, Dan, and Kathy will be answering your questions a little later. So if you're wondering about any of the investigations or victories we're discussing today, it's now time to press zero on your phone or ask your question directly through your web browser. Kathy, back to you. Thanks, Ben. Recent exposés like those at Liberty and at the Pet Blood Bank may be deeply upsetting, but it's also really important to remember that stopping the exploitation and the abuse of animals in laboratories doesn't often happen overnight. And that was certainly the case with our campaign against Marshall McHugh, an experimenter at St. Mary's University in San Antonio, Texas. McHugh has made his career out of starving hundreds of animals in very twisted experiments. In one experiment, he withheld food from 52 rats for 11 days at a time, and he confined them alone to tiny cages without even a scrap of bedding material. They couldn't even have that comfort because he was afraid that in their desperation they might have eaten it, and each animal was inhumanely gassed to death when McHugh was done with them. 
More recently, he published a paper in which he describes how he starved more than 100 animals, including geckos, quail, mice, toads, sometimes for as long as a month, before he killed them and examined their intestines and other organs. And what were the conclusions he drew from this torture? Results that couldn't be applied to humans or other animals that, yet again, verified the immense physiological differences between species, which is something we've known for decades. Well, I'm happy to say that just two weeks ago, the president of St. Mary's wrote to PETA to tell us that McHugh's cruel starvation experiments are done. It took emails from more than 185,000 PETA supporters for that university to finally pull the plug on McHugh, and now we're hoping that another Texas university will soon realize that we're not going to give up until their cruel experiments come to an end, too. And you may have guessed I'm talking about the experiments at Texas A&M University, also known as TAMU. And I'm sure many of you know, late last year, a PETA expose revealed footage of bone-thin golden retrievers who were bred to suffer from canine muscular dystrophy at that laboratory. Most of those dogs can barely walk or even balance on their own. They're housed in these terrible barren metal cells. They struggle even to swallow the thin gruel that is their only food because their tongues are so swollen that's all they can swallow. Many of them have long ropes of saliva that dangle from their mouths because their jaw muscles have been so severely weakened by the disease. And there are some dogs there who carry the gene, but they don't suffer from the disease. But they're kept there for breeding, and they're condemned to spend their lives in the same small metal cages without so much as a blanket for comfort. For more than 35 years, experimenter Joe Cornegie has been conducting these barbaric studies on dogs like these. And he's even invented a crude technique where the dog's muscles are repeatedly stretched with a motorized lever in order to cause painful muscle tears. Right now, Tamu's president is taking home a salary of a million dollars a year, along with $200,000 a year housing allowance, bonuses for his fundraising performances, membership in a country club, and on top of that, he got an $800,000 signing bonus when he took the job. And all this is going on while the dogs are suffering in these cages without so much as a blanket. Since our first expose, since our expose first broke, I should say, Tamu has been inundated with letters, with phone calls and emails from PETA supporters urging the university to end these worthless experiments, to stop the breeding, and to give each of these dogs a chance at a life in a caring home. Well, now we've kicked our campaign into high gear. We're placing ads near the campus calling out the agony suffered by the dogs in these experiments. We've repeatedly disrupted events by TAMU officials, including a Board of Regents meeting earlier this month, you can see that video on our site too, to call attention to the suffering. And we even stood in the rain and protested in front of the campus as Hurricane Harvey slammed into Texas. PETA's loudly targeted the university on social media. We provided testimony from scientists who criticized the experiments as having no relevance to humans. And we shared calls from both TAMU graduates and muscular dystrophy patients who are demanding that the cruel experiments come to an end. The university has been so overwhelmed by our constant pressure, by your constant pressure, that they've even lied at least once about ending the experiments. But that pressure will never let up so long as the dogs are suffering at Texas A&M. Thank you, Kathy. I want to take a moment to give our listeners one last chance to ask a question at the end of today's meeting. So if you haven't already, please press zero now on your phone to ask about any of the work that we're discussing. And of course, please consider pressing seven or visiting peter.org slash match to donate before our matching gift challenge, sorry, our matching gift campaign ends. Kathy. Uh, let, let me just uh, jump in here, please, because I, I don't want to miss saying thank you to, to as many people as possible. John from Florida, thank you, thank you. $100 from you. Pamela from Houston, $100. Suzanne from California, thank you so much. You're sending us $7. We appreciate it. Jennifer from Texas, $300. That makes $600. And Gail from North Carolina, $25. Thank you so much. You're helping us get there. We're getting there. <laughs> Back to you, Kathy. 
Thank you. Well, before we leave this topic of universities, I just want to talk for a moment about why I know that we'll bring an end to these experiments at Texas A&M. Many of you may have heard of a cat named Double Trouble. A disturbing picture of her is being used right, uh, being used in a deadly brain. Let me say that properly. There's a disturbing picture of her being used in a deadly brain experiment at the University of Wisconsin Madison, and it's on the front of the donate section of PETA's website right now. Double Trouble had holes drilled into her skull. She had metal restraint posts screwed into her head, and steel coils were implanted in her eyes as part of extremely cruel sound localization experiments at University of Wisconsin. PETA campaigned vigorously against these experiments for more than a year, and we showed millions of people the cruelty that these cats were forced to endure. We held many eye-catching protests. We placed ads featuring Double Trouble on buses and on benches. And we had Bill Maher leave a voicemail message on the phones of the entire campus. And we even got actor James Cromwell to disrupt the school's Board of Regents meeting. It took all of that work, along with more than 360,000 emails from PETA supporters, to end those experiments. Every experimenter, whether they're on a university campus or in a facility like Liberty, knows that PETA is in it for the long haul and that we will never, ever relent in our work to end the torture that they do to animals. Yes, they should know that. We have a wonderful track record. Once we dig our teeth in, we're not letting go. Thank you, Gladys of Rhode Island, for $50. Madeline of Florida, $100. Lynn of Nova Scotia, $50. Karen of Pomona, $200. Suzanne, $10. Thank you. Hester of Brooklyn, $100. All these donations are being doubled, and it's fantastic. Um, they will help us do more and more for animals. Our campaigns have already stopped deadly training exercises on dogs by the University of Georgia. And we've helped end gruesome classroom, classroom animal laboratories like those at the University of Colorado Boulder, where students cut open live rats and then applied drugs to their exposed beating hearts. For what? In the last year, we've convinced two multi-billion dollar medical device makers, Johnson and & Johnson Johnson and, and Sanofi, uh, to stop killing pigs that they were killing in cruel sales trainings. We've pushed the USDA, or excuse me, the FDA actually, we've pushed the Food and Drug Administration to for the first time ever accept the results of human-based skin irritancy tests in place of those on animals. And you know how that's done. They shave the skin, they make it raw, and they put the substance on. It's pretty hideous. Um, we have had them uh, end the use of live animals in surgical trauma training in Kenya and in four more countries since we spoke to you last by donating these state-of-the-art simulators that we use now. This work is sparing thousands of animals in, I think we are up to 21 countries now around the world, getting the animals out of the labs. Um, and that's all that is without even mentioning all of PETA's regulatory testing department work and what they're accomplishing for animals, which is phenomenal. Whenever government regulatory agencies require tests on animals to be conducted, such as the Environmental Protection Agency requiring that industrial chemicals be tested on animals, this um, regulatory testing department at PETA does all it can to see that these tests are replaced with specific, very specific non-animal test methods. No animal organization puts as much hard science into replacing these required tests as, as we do. This year, our scientists' work led to the US Food and Drug Administration accepting the results of human-based tests in place of those that use animals to screen for ir skin irritation and allergic reactions that are caused by personal lubricant products. PETA scientists are now presenting on the use of non-animal test methods at very important conferences, like that of the biggest pesticide industry trade association. It's called Crop Life America. So our papers are being regularly published in respected scientific and trade journals, including six 
peer-reviewed publications in just the last year. So scientists are reading our work and adopting it as their own. As a member of the PETA International Science Consortium Limited, that's a regulatory testing team, uh, we're spreading uh, our expertise from our scientists around the world. Recently, our scientists worked with their colleagues to cancel um, about 1,300 animals uh, that we use during pregnancy or as newborns um, before killing, uh, being killed and dissected. And the work of the regulatory testing team may not make many headlines in these cases, but it's making waves in boardrooms and government offices around the world. I just want to um, not only thank Kathy for what she's been telling us, she has so much, and, um, but I want to thank Sheila, New York, $7. Thank you so much. Gail, Windsor, Ontario, $1,000. That becomes $2,000 for the animals. Terry, $40, $40. Thank you so much. Elizabeth from Georgia, $35. Cynthia from Vermont, $35. Barbara San Diego, $100. Kathleen, $50. Claudine from Washington. My Claudine, hello. $300, bless your heart. Josephine from Brooklyn, $100. Lynn, $25. Jerry, $100. All this is being doubled right now, and it's absolutely wonderful. Um, every dollar you give is going to be matched, meaning twice the resources for the vital work that we're doing for animals. Um, before we take your questions, I am so hoping that um, we could just, um, I don't know if there's anything else you can put in, Kathy. We've got such a long list of people who are waiting. But I think questions would be more important. So take a last minute, hit seven on your phone to support our animals out of the lab double challenge, and press zero to ask a question. We only have a few hours left in this critically important campaign. So as you know, everybody out there who's listening cares about animals deeply. Everybody knows our track record, our work history. We do need every donation we can get to try to reach that $500,000 goal before midnight tomorrow. It is such a gift. It is such a wonderful thing. I really, really don't want us to miss any of it. So. Let's get to the questions, shall we, Ben, and, uh, and uh, move on. Thank you, Ingrid. And just before we do get to the questions, uh, to everyone pressing 7 right now, thank you so much. Please keep pressing 7. We will get to your donation. And keep listening in and pressing 7, and we'll get to your donation as soon as possible. Um, so our first question comes from Pam in St. Petersburg, Florida. Pam says, I've lived with a recent uh, rescued greyhound and would love to do so again. Is there a place I can find out about adopting one of the blood, the blood bank dogs? Ingrid. Um, yes, absolutely. Thank you for that lovely question. And of course, if you can't adopt one of this particular blood bank uh, rescued dogs, then, as we all know, the racetracks are chucking them out hand over fist, and they're all wonderful, and they all need homes. There is great, uh, there are greyhound rescue places that you can Google near you. Um, they're all over the place. They do wonderful work. But these dogs, a lot of them are going to a place called Greyhound Adoption League of Texas. That's Greyhound Adoption League of Texas. It's in Dallas, and I'm afraid I don't have the number handy, but it's easy to find, Greyhound Adoption League of Texas, and good luck. I hope you get one on your couch soon. <laughs> Thank you, Pam, for your question. Um, we now have a live caller, Blaze from New York City. New York, Blaze, are you on the phone? Hi, I'm here. Blaise? Hi, what's your yeah, question, I'm Blaze? Here. Hi, I, I, um, first of all, thank you for everything you do. Uh, you guys are great. I have a question for you. Uh, ben, I think you mentioned that humans voluntarily give blood. Uh, I'm a dog owner and I have a cat. How 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 is the veterinary industry supposed to get blood uh, when you don't have dogs and cats walking in to do it voluntarily? Kathy, or should I take it? I think Dan might actually want to take that one, but I'm, I'm, oh, great. I can talk to that too. Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm happy to speak to, speak to that. Thank you for the good question. It's, it's a very good point. 
Um, we've consulted with uh, veterinarians in clinical practice and uh, also hematology experts, which is the science of blood transfusions for animals. <clears throat> and in fact, there are a number of community-based uh, blood banks around the U.S. Some of them are operated by veterinary hospitals. Uh, some of them are oper operated by nonprofits. And they rely solely uh, on people like you who uh, have dogs at home who are not stressed by a trip to the veterinarian, who are docile, um, and who can go in um, and once they've been screened, provided they're in good health and weigh over 60 pounds, um, can safely uh, have their blood drawn from them in a veterinary clinic um, and have that be cut on hand for use in transfusions in critical care uh, cases. Um, one of the one of the, the great things that has come from this case, uh, from the blood bank case, is, is a, a heightened awareness among the veterinary community in the U.S. Uh, that this is a totally unregulated industry. There is no federal oversight whatsoever of this industry. There's only one state in the union that has anything on the books pertaining to it. And that keeping animals warehouse uh, solely for their blood uh, is inhumane and that there are alternatives uh, to that that would serve animals in need uh, without costing the so-called donors their lives. Obviously, animals do not sign up to donate like you and I do, uh, but those of us who have animals, if they're of the temperament and health that would make them uh, um, a good candidate to go into the clinic and donate uh, twice a year, maybe three times a year, uh, that is something that many veterinarians are amenable to, uh, and that would help uh, animals who unfortunately find themselves in need of uh, plasma or red blood cells. Yeah, and they would live Thanks. at home, of course, which is just wonderful. And if they're big veined dogs, you know, they it's, you don't even feel it if they're calm, thin coated, big veined dogs, unfortunately, like greyhounds, which is why they abuse them. And afterwards, they get a treat and they go home again. It's wonderful. Thank you, Ingrid. Thank you, Dan. And thank you, Blaze, for your, for your fabulous question. Um, we should have another live caller now, Anna Marie in Butler, Pennsylvania. Anna Marie, what's your question for Ingrid, Kathy, and Dan? Oh, hi. My question was, I think you may have already partially answered this question. I've been hearing a lot of things on the news about um, the current administration trying to fast track um, drugs and make them cheaper. And I wondered if this means that the FDA is now moving away from animal tests and going towards the, you know, organs on chips and all the things that are available that are a lot faster and cheaper. I think I could take that one. Um, you know, that's what we're pressing for. When this administration came in, we provided documentation on the failure of animals in this area. Right now, 95% of drugs that test safe and effective in animals fail in human clinical trials. So that's a, and after that, another half of them fail if they make it as far as the market. So we're talking about a 95 plus percent failure rate on drug testing right now. So clearly something else has to be done. The FDA and the and even NIH to some degree has acknowledged this, but they haven't really moved forward fast enough. The obvious solution is to move away from the use of animals and to validate and approve these non-animal methods. We, we aren't seeing that as quickly as we would like. We are certainly in there advocating for this. We're, we're in touch with uh, members of Congress, with the various agencies, and with the administration itself on that very issue. So we're, we're working quite hard for that. I think you're right, though, that the first step is to try to move these things forward quickly, but it has to be acknowledged that the animal studies just aren't working. Thank, thank you. you. Let me just jump in, if I may. Um, sure. I have to say some thank yous because these are big thank yous. Everybody who is helping by pressing seven, uh, you're a champion in our minds. And if dogs could wag their tails at you, they would. Uh, Linda from Connecticut, fifty dollars. Thank you, Aaron from California, forty-five. Becky from Oklahoma, a hundred dollars. Thank you, Carol from Florida, seven dollars. Norma from Tennessee, fifteen. Karen from California, $250. Gertrude from Arkansas, $100. Katie from Arizona, $40. Judy from New York, $200. 
this is adding up. We have got to make that challenge match, and this is adding up. So thank you, thank you, all of you very much. Thank you, Ingrid. Um, next, we have another live caller, Nick in Pennsylvania. Nick, what's your question, please? Hi. Well, first of all, thank you to everyone who does the incredible work you do at Peter, including uh, especially those who do the undercover work. I just can't imagine being able to do that. Um, yeah. But my question to the people who do the undercover work is basically how do you cope with the secondary trauma you must experience from seeing the horrors um, that you see? Well, I think I should mention um, thank you very much for that too because I think every one of us who works here um, is beholden to the undercover people. And they, when you talk to them, uh, you really feel so awful for them because um, one of our investigators said to me, the worst thing is that you feel you've betrayed the animals. And I said, how can you possibly think that? And he said, well, you're standing there and terrible, terrible things are being done to them. And yet you are not saying stop that and you're not jumping forward and pulling the animals out because you know that if you did, your camera would be confiscated, you'd be out the door, you wouldn't have the footage, you'd never save animals in the future. And so uh, they, they bear this terrible burden of not just the horror they see, but of guilt from not being able to act immediately, but having to stand there and keep filming and sometimes smile and just move about. But I must say, and it's going to embarrass him, Dan Payton is on the line. Um, it's hard for any of us to watch any of this footage as it comes through, and it comes through all the time. But Dan Payton has to watch it over and over and over again as he puts together his cases. So the person in the field is suffering from shooting it, and Dan Payton is really... Um, and he, nobody here is made of steel. You know, everybody here cries. Everybody here feels just awful um, about what we see. But we know we have to, and Dan Payton is a real soldier in this. So thank you for that question. Thank you. And thank you very much, Dan and Ingrid. Um, we are running short on time, but I've just been told that if it's all right with everybody, we will go ahead an extra 10 minutes. So please do stay on the line. We are getting to your questions. And next on the line, we should have Cesar from Toronto. Cesar, what's your question, please? Cesar, are you there? Nope. Okay. Sorry, Cesar. Uh, well, please, Ben, uh, may do... I just jump in then? Please. Would you mind if I just... I want to thank Marilyn from Nevada, our first Nevada person, $200. Hazel from Texas, where the blood bank, I was going to say is, but it's now was, $500. That makes $1,000 towards our match. Elizabeth in Texas, another $500. Thank you so much. Martha from Valley Stream, $25. That'll make it $50. Alice, Ontario, $100. Rudy from Ontario, $7. Thank you. Edna from Massachusetts, $50. Terrific. Sharon from Georgia, $100. And Janet from Illinois, $25. It all adds up. It's all precious, and it all goes to help animals. So thank you. Keep going. Thank you, Ingrid. Um, hopefully, we have Cesar. Are you there, Cesar? No. How about Nick in Pennsylvania? Nick, are you on the line? No, we're not doing too well right here. How about we go to one of the online questions? Um, Sue from Toronto asked, how do hello. I talk to a friend? Oh, hello. Who's that? This is Herschel. I have called and they told me to uh, click in. Oh, yeah. Go for it, Herschel. What's your question, please? Yes, I'm from Neptune, New Jersey. My thing is, I have a question. I am i don't have the monetary donations to do, but I've been signing the petitions, and I've been passing out the flyers and everything that you guys have been sending to me, but I wanted to know what else I could do to help. And also, I wanted oh. to thank Ingrid so much for all the letters and cards of support for helping me to keep encouraged. Oh, Herschel, 
Thank you so much, and thank you for your activism. We need the funds because we can hire people, we can hire equipment, we can get into the labs, we can do all these things, but we also need the activism. And everybody, if we all acted, it would stop. So I am indebted to you for your work. Just let us know, however many pamphlets, wherever you can hand them out. We leave them in grocery stores, we put them on bulletin boards, we leave them in doctor's offices in the back of the bus seat everywhere so that some unsuspecting person never thinking about animals in labs might come across a piece of educational material and have their eyes opened. Um, but please, if you've got social media, the most important thing is to show those videos to people because then they see it with their own eyes and they can't deny it and it will, those images will stay with them. So again, back to uh, the earlier thing about the earlier comment about the undercover investigator is that without those videos, without those photographs, uh, it wouldn't be as powerful. We would still be doing it, but they're wonderful. Herschel, thank you so much. We had an online question from Sue from Toronto who asked, how do I talk to a friend with muscular dystrophy about the experiments at Texas A&M? Kathy, maybe you want to take this one. Sure. I would just tell them the facts and show them the video and the supporting evidence that we have. We are in touch with a lot of people who have muscular dystrophy and a lot of people who've lost children to muscular dystrophy, which is particularly moving. And they oppose the use of dogs in these experiments, and they oppose them both because they understand how these dogs suffer. Nobody understands better than these people do how much those dogs are suffering. They don't want the dogs suffering in their name. And they're also upset because putting money toward experiments on dogs is delaying whatever cure or effective treatment there might be for human beings. This money can be better spent. It's not being spent well on the on the dog experiments. So I have found people to be very open to it. They have sought us out. They have called us as soon as they've seen the video. So if you can just direct them to our website and the video and the supporting information, I think that would do it. Thank you, Kathy. Um, Tim from Columbus also wrote, uh, Columbus, Ohio, what would you consider Peter's biggest win against animal testing in the last decade? Oh, trip down memory lane for you, Ingrid. <laughs> yes, I'll be old person. <laughs> and by the way, Ben, <laughs> and I hope you are still telling people, I'm not sure if people can still um, ask a question, but what are those, is it zero for a question and seven it for a donation? It is zero for a question, yeah. Yes, indeed. Okay, and seven for a donation. Please help us get us over that line. We're hanging on here. It's, it's very exciting. Um, well, I, there are so many. I mean, if people ask me if I could pick just one thing, I pick a visual thing, which is that all the car companies in the entire world were crashing baboons and monkeys into walls to test steering wheels and to do other kinds of car crash tests. And we stopped them all. General Motors was the last one. And uh, they were very resistant. We basically did everything, as Hamami Gingold would say, we did it all except underwater, or including underwater. I mean, we really, people donated their old General Motors cars to them, and we took them outside auto sh shows and painted them. and. Um, set them a light in the end because they wouldn't listen to us. And eventually, they were so worried about what we'd do next. We didn't really know what we could do next. We'd done everything we could think of that uh, General Motors stopped using animals in car crash tests. So whenever you see those mannequins on the television adverts and so on, that's because Peter stopped all the car crash tests. But there are so many wonderful things, and I would say, I do believe that the biggest victory was um, stopping, I think it was six million animals from being used to test environmental chemicals. And no one can say, oh, well, will we be at risk? Because no, we're not at risk. There are the, there's the grass list, which is generally recognized as safe. There are high-speed computers you program with data from actual interaction of various components of chemicals. We can do so much better that those six million animals would have suffered so awfully 
and died so badly just because somebody didn't think to look and see if there was a more modern method, and, and we got them to do that. So um, there are many of them, Ben, many of them. <laughs> Thank you, Ingrid. And yes, people are still asking questions. We should have another live caller now. Donata from Miami. Donata, what's your question, please? If these companies, these um, millionaire companies, know that these tests on animals don't work, that uh, it's, uh, it's a loss of time and money, why do they continue insisting on it? Oh, I can take that, I think, yes. Uh, well, the, there are many reasons. And I, I think with companies, we sometimes have more success in ending the animal studies than we do with universities, for example, because companies are not dependent upon animal tests in the way that, that one would think in order to do their business. So we work regularly with Fortune 100 chemical companies, for example, and we work with them to reduce um, the use of animals to end certain animal tests to make things better all around. But I think one of the reasons is inertia. Uh, they have done it this way always. They haven't figured out yet how to stop it. They haven't got people who care enough to look into it. I mean, if you think about the the representatives from pharmaceutical companies who walked inside Liberty and saw that place and still gave it money to do an animal experiment, it's, it's kind of unbelievable. But I think sometimes they just don't see it and don't think about how to change. With the universities, it's a different story because they rely on government grants for huge income. It's a moneymaker to them. It's a career path and it's a gravy train and they don't want to give it up because they don't want to give up the money. Yeah, Thank that's, you, that's totally right. I think that, Ben, I'm getting the message, you probably have it please. too, that we have to get off the phone, but please know that we only have so many hours left, and please go, uh, even after this call, um, and tomorrow morning, peter.org slash match. By tomorrow at midnight, we are hoping with every fiber of our being to have made this match. Um, it's a $500,000 match. It's a tall mountain, but if we do that, we will have a million dollars to put into this campaign. And we buy equipment. We give grants to alternatives to animal use um, so that they can put in modern methods. It, it really is the best money in the world well spent. Rosalind from New York, thank you so much for helping us with $100. Ursula, $10. We appreciate it. Linda from Jamaica Plains, $5. Thank you very much. Carol from Washington, thank you for $50. Anne from Portland, thank you for $50. Thank you every single person who has helped us this evening and who is an activist and is a PETA supporter. And please, again, um, think of PETA.org slash match by tomorrow at midnight and help us make this um, wonderful thing happen for animals. Thank you, everybody. And this, um, I hope to hear from you and see you and come to our Norfolk office, come to our DC office, come to our LA office, and please come back to our town halls. Thank you very much. Well, this concludes today's Peter Town Hall. I hope that you'll join us again for our next town hall this January. Um, thanks to everyone who submitted questions. And if we didn't have time to get to your question during this call, uh, someone will get in touch with you during the next few days. So thank you again for your compassion and have a good evening.